Hello, I'm Richard Larson from the University of Chicago, and with me is Charles Mulligan from St. Jude Children's Hospital, and Dan D'Angelo from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. We've just finished a, a session talking about the treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia here at the International Workshop on Acute Leukemias. So let me uh, start first with uh, Charles and ask you about uh, uh, your uh, upcoming trial uh, in childhood ALL and how you'll take into account uh, some of the genetic uh, heterogeneity that you've identified in childhood ALL. Certainly. So the next study of childhood ALL at St. Jude is called Total Therapy 17. And this seeks to build on the outstanding success of childhood ALL treatment from St. Jude and other cooperative groups over the last decades. The goal of this is not so much to try and statistically meaningfully improve survival rates or outcome rates, but to maintain the excellent survival rates that already exceed 90% but to try and implement a range of novel, targeted, and genetically informed approaches to uh, reduce toxicity. So these include um, genome sequencing of all patients at the time of diagnosis, um, in part to replace some existing diagnostic approaches with more accurate and detailed approaches, to identify targets for therapeutic intervention with kinase inhibitors, and to also, and importantly, look at risk factors for toxicity, whether they're you know, long-term toxicities and neuropathy, or short-term toxicities, such as the toxic effects of anti-leukemic agents, such as thiopurines. There are a number of other approaches that we're incorporating, such as bringing some immunotherapeutic approaches a little more upfront than the relapsed and refractory setting, um, such as antibody-based approaches like blenitumumab for poorly responsive disease, and also CAR T-cell therapy for persisting residual disease after early therapy. And Dan, let me ask you about some of the novel agents that uh, have been uh, developed and frankly approved just within the last uh, two years for adults with ALL. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, immunoconjugates and the bispecific antibodies as well as CAR T cell therapy? Sure. Uh, there's been a, a luxury of riches in the field of ALL. For almost a decade, there was no movement in terms of uh, approvals of new therapies. Uh, but now we have two effective therapies that were approved uh, for all ages, uh, uh, blinitumumab, uh, which was initially approved two years ago in the United States and got full approval this summer, uh, both for Philadelphia negative as well as now for Philadelphia positive as well as pediatric ALL. Uh, and this is an immunoconjugate, uh, which is a really a bispecific, bringing in a active component targeting CD3, which is a T cell, the patient's own T cells or transplanted T cell if the patient had a relapse after transplant, and CD19 targeted on the, on the disease. Uh, and with continuous infusion for four, week, uh, for four weeks of therapy and a two-week break, uh, about half the patients, 43% to be specific, have been able to enter a remission. And these remissions have been durable enough to go on to stem cell transplantation uh, for those patients who have a, a donor and are eligible. So really clearly an advance forward. Uh, now the uh, strategies are trying to, as with anything, move blinitumab into the uh, frontline setting with a variety of strategies, either combining it with chemotherapy or uh, in cycles of consolidation. And then inotuzumab was just approved uh, at the end of the summer in patients both with Philadelphia positive and Philadelphia negative, a CD22 uh, positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now this is a classical antibody drug conjugate where colichomycin is attached to a humanized anti-CD22 antibody. And so the theme here is you're bringing colichomycin to the disease itself. Uh, and in this particular uh, study, comparing inotuzumab to standard chemotherapy, there was a dramatically higher proportion of patients who went into remission, about 80% versus approximately 30% to standard of care therapy. And in addition to getting into remission, uh, almost 80% of those patients went into an MRD negative status. And as a result, there was an improvement in overall survival. So both agents are effective in, adult, in adults depending upon CD19 or CD22 expression.
And as these drugs move into frontline therapy, do you think they'll have an impact on the need for allogeneic transplantation in adults? Well, I think that's a great question. And, and I, and, you know, uh, sadly, the uh, the state of affairs in adult uh, therapy for ALL is far behind my colleagues. Uh, uh, in terms of pediatric approaches, both in terms of understanding the molecular heterogeneity as well as identifying those patients who are at high risk for relapse, specifically MRD negative status. So the hope is by moving uh, either Blina or inotuzumab or both uh, into the frontline setting, we're going to improve the MRD negative status in these patients and as a result uh, improve their event free and overall survival, therefore minimizing the need for stem cell transplantation. That's the hope. And Charles, in children with pH positive ALL, allogeneic transplantation is becoming less often recommended because of the success of tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor based uh, treatments. Are there subsets of childhood ALL now that uh, a priority uh, would, would go directly to transplant in first remission? Well, I think those decisions are made partly according to very high risk subtyping, but also according to MRD response. And in general, at St. Jude, the decision to go to transplantation is based on incomplete response with persisting MRD. There are some exceptions in previous studies, for example, very high risk subtypes such as early T cell precursor leukemia have routinely been directed to allogeneic transplantation. And in fact, that's been highly successful in mitigating the previously poor outcome that's been seen in that subtype. So moving forward, you know, like my colleague's studies, the goal is to try and reduce the, you know, effective but admittedly toxic effects of this form of therapy, which is in a childhood context adding even more burden of morbidity in the long term. We're hoping that whether it's a targeted approach or bringing forward some of the immunotherapeutic approaches that we can maintain those high success rates, but by achieving less um, positivity for MRD in more patients, that these patients are then not directed to allogeneic transplantation. Uh, we didn't have time to discuss during the workshop the, the role of cranial irradiation. Are there still subsets of children where that's routinely recommended for prophylaxis against uh, CNS recurrence? I think it depends on the clinical trial. So at St. Jude, that has been abandoned completely. There's no routine prophylactic CNS irradiation. Um, there have been in the previous studies that, the, for example, total 15, which was the first study in which that was um, removed from therapy, there were some isolated CNS relapses, but they could be salvaged and overall outcomes were not inferior to prior studies where CNS irradiation were used. But it is a question of intent of different groups and some of the cooperative pediatric groups still do use prophylactic CNS irradiation for very high risk groups. Dan, let me ask you a similar question. For adults, these uh, antibodies are unlikely to penetrate into the central nervous system, although I believe that CAR T cells do. But are there groups of adults who should routinely receive cranial irradiation for prophylaxis during first remission? So it's been less studied than, uh, than in the pediatric group. So the current uh, alliance-led cooperative group trial, which is using a children's oncology group or COG-based trial, cranial radiation is, is uh, reduced to those patients with T-cell immunophenotype, which are not included in the current alliance trial, uh, but were included in Wendy Stock's uh, study. So we, we still do that in T-cell immunophenotype, or for patients who had positive CNS and diagnosis. So th those are the two patients that uh, we have routinely uh, uh, utilized uh, cranial radiation as prophylaxis slash treatment, uh, depending on whether they had positive disease at diagnosis or they have a T-cell immunophenotype. And let me ask you both uh, whether you're optimistic that things will be different in three or four years than they are today in terms of what we can offer uh, children or adults with ALL. I'll start. I, I think it's been a huge improvement in terms of outcome of patients. From when I was a, uh, a young fellow, uh, learning the uh, the ropes were you know, only about a third of adult patients were really being cured, uh, and now the, the results are well over 50%, and hopefully uh, by improving uh, their outcomes by being able to genetically stratify patients using uh, what Charles and others have developed as this Philadelphia light, figuring out who those patients are, and monitoring patients for response because the depth of response is so important based on MRD, and, and then adding these immunoconjugates and CAR T cell therapies. Hopefully, the, you know, the preponderance of all these issues will improve the outcome.
Charles? I agree. I think we've seen such a rapid pace of change and such great discovery in the last few years. We're just seeing the first fruits of that being translated into clinical care, and we'll see you know, much deeper integration of genomic approaches into management, the next generation of antibody and CAR T-cell approaches, as well as some other agents that we've not discussed today, you know, targeted approaches that are also showing great promise. So I think the future's bright. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.